Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another edition of the Surf and Sales podcast. We are very, very excited to be speaking to a good friend of ours that Scott and I have known. I'm here, of course, with my friend Scott Lees. But we're also joined by uh, someone we've gotten to know very well over the last year and a half or so, uh, Blanche Reese, who is a commercial account executive over at SalesLoft. So, Blanche, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me, guys. I'm excited. Yeah, it's good to see you again. Yeah, we are too. Likewise, yes. What? So, so I want to sort of um, just start with a little bit of background for people. Like, who is Blanche? Where did you start? Where did you grow up? You know, how did you get into sales in the first place? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, it's been a trend that I've seen in a lot of the, the podcasts that you guys have done so far is that nobody really intended to get into sales. Um, I won't say nobody, but it seems like for the most part, nobody was like, yeah, that's my goal. Majority. Majority. <laughs> um, so it would be similar for me. So uh, I am from Greenville, South Carolina. That's actually where I live now. But I grew up fourth child of four kids. Um, we weren't necessarily a family that was super business oriented. My dad was a lawyer. Um, he's actually now getting his executive MBA to get into the business world in his 60s, which I think is pretty fantastic. Um, and my mom has always been a real estate agent. She was the top agent and continues to be the top agent for South Carolina as a state um, for the majority of her career. So she ended up opening up her own business. So I guess if anything, I've seen sales from her. Your mom's the number one real estate agent in South Carolina? Oh, yeah. So that's pretty businessy. <laughs> yes, wow. but I mean, it wasn't like a corporate environment. Um, she only ever had a corporate job for about a year uh, and then decided, you know, I'm going to transition. We're going to do real estate. And she's opened up her own business, partnered with Sotheby's now, and um, has continued to just kind of kick ass. And so I... When I was in college, I was encouraged to take a business major from my family. They said, you know, you should, you should get into the business world. I think that's what kind of makes sense for you. But sales was definitely not on the radar. And at Clemson, where I did my, um, where I went to college. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> my 10 year old son is obsessed with Clemson. He's going to hit you up for like a letter of recommendation at some point. Please do. If you guys ever want to go visit, I will go with you. I love that place. It's, awesome. it's heaven on earth, <laughs> but it probably a, a lot of people don't agree. <laughs> um, anyway, so at Clemson, when you, um, when you are a business major, you do a year of just business. And then after that, you have to decide like what within that major are you going to do? Um, I was going to fail econ my freshman year. I, I could not pass. I could not understand it. I still struggle with it a lot. I know supply and demand, but you know, a lot of econ is just very confusing to me. So with that, my, my professor in econ came to me the last day before you could drop a class without it affecting your GPA and said, you should, you should drop the class and you should switch majors because this isn't going to work for you. So I transitioned from a, a business major to psychology, loved psychology, absolutely fell in love with it. Yeah, I think it's, it's just a really interesting, it's a cool thing to, to be able to better understand what people around you are going through or what they may be going through or um, what goes on in people's minds. So it was a natural fit for me. Um, and my senior year, I had planned on going to grad school, going to get my master's in social work. I had done an internship over the summer with a group home. Uh, it was really rewarding, tough, but rewarding. And that was kind of the plan. Um, had my very first ever panic attack before I went to go take the GRE. So I figured, hey, I don't think I can go to school for a couple more years. I need to, need to get out of this. Um, so, and I know I'm giving you guys like a really long version here, but Basically, after I decided I'm not going to go back to school right now, I'll evaluate that again later on. I was looking for any job that I could find because I knew as soon as I walk across the stage at graduation, I'm handed my diploma. My parents are not going to continue to support me. So it was, it was dire that I needed to figure something out. I didn't want to be a bartender or a waitress. I, go ahead. Yeah. So was that, was that part of the plan with your parents? Was that like, hey, look, Blanche, when you get through college, we put you through here starting, you know, July 1 or whatever that day is, you're on your own. 
yeah, pretty much. That's what they had done with all my siblings. Obviously, if if any of us had ever gotten to a situation where we had zero dollars left, they were going to jump in and help. Um, right. But it was also a, a state of pride for me. I didn't want to have to say, hey, I'm going to move in with my parents and, and do this for a while, or I'm going to have to ask them for additional help for the first few months. I, I wanted to be able mm -hmm. to support myself. So I took mm -hmm. the first job offer I got. Um, it moved me to New York. It was a company, I'm not going to say the name of the company, but people can look it up on LinkedIn if they want. <laughs> um, it was a company where I was responsible for selling luxury flowers. And uh, I learned a lot of information about flowers and plants, and I was making about 120 cold calls a day. They didn't call it an SDR, so I didn't know that I was an SDR at the time. Um, but it was on a salary of about $30,000 a year in New York City. So that was really, really tough. Um, I was working Saturdays how did you, and How Sundays. many roommates did you have? I actually lived in like a, I lived in like a dorm inside of mm -hmm. the, I'm going to forget the name of the hotel, but there's a hotel that's in Midtown um, that has like eight floors that are dorms that can be rented out by students. And so my dad kind of helped me fudge things a little bit to make it look like I was still a student. I, eh, it's okay. Um, so I was able to stay there for three months while I was in New York. And then the last month that I was there, luckily one of my friends from home, her older sister had an apartment that she needed to be subletted for the last month that I was there. So it worked out perfectly. Um, then they kind of promoted you after three months of success, which by the way, was unusual. I started with a group of 10 people. By the end of that summer, I was the only person from that higher group left. Everybody else had been fired. People were fired like every two weeks. Love this. <laughs> um, it was it was a tough environment, but I think it taught me a lot about what I want in a company, what I want in a job, and um, it gave me a lot of quick knowledge of like you either sink or swim. So I learned how to swim pretty quick. Um, they moved me to Atlanta, and I found sales off. Well, I didn't find sales sales off. Sales off found me through my sister. Um, interviewed with sales loft. I actually turned them down initially, which I don't oh. know if I should be sharing that, but I'm going to. So <laughs> why did you I think that's great though? Over? Yeah, this uh, is like fantastic. This is what we, <laughs> the stuff we want to hear. So I turned it down because I'd only been at my company for four months. I was only four months out of college and I felt like I wasn't giving the job that I had a real shot. And I felt like maybe I was kind of doing that typical millennial thing of like, oh, I'm just going to move on really quickly. I'm going to jump to the next job. And I kind of took a look at myself in the mirror and said like, you need to give this a, a little bit longer. Um, I only gave it two more months because I ended up having a giant fight with my manager. And if anybody knows me, I'm not a fighter. I am not somebody who yells. I've probably yelled at people twice in my life. And that's including when I was a camp counselor yelling at kids. So it's, it's very unusual for me. My husband and I have been together for nine years. We've probably had like four fights ever. Um, and I, it's, it's very, it's not a good environment if I have somebody who's like fighting me on things. And so after that conversation with my manager, I called up Katie Christian, who's no longer at sales off, but she was leading up our customer success efforts at the time. I called her and I said, do you still have an opening? And can you still talk to me about this? I'll take any job you guys have. Came back in the next day, signed an offer letter to be a customer success manager at sales loft. Um, and started the week after Thanksgiving. So that's kind how, of how, how I got How big was Sales Loft then? I was the yeah, 29th so, hire. How big was Sales Loft? You were 29. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's a completely different world. Yeah. Very different world. That's, it's that's really interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys are yeah. familiar with Pingboard, but there's... Uh, they're, they're, they're in Austin. I, I, uh, they used to be a client of mine. I invited them. Yeah, so we use it now internally at SalesLoft as just like a way of understanding what the org structure is, who reports to who and all that. And it's interesting because I would have never thought, oh, SalesLoft is going to need something like this. And it tells you what tenure you are in the company. And I'm now the ninth most tenured person at the company. So it's, wow. it's really crazy to see how much has changed, how we've grown, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of how I got to SalesLoft. But I guess that didn't really answer how I got to sales again at sales off because that was customer success <laughs> talk, talk but what have you liked but what have you yeah go ahead scott talk to us about the journey from customer success manager to commercial 
AE where you are now? Um, it's a weird journey. And it's funny because a lot of people at Salesloft will kind of say to me, like, you've done everything at the company. What are you going to do next? Like, when are you going to get to C-suite, et cetera? Like, it's kind of a running joke of the fact that I've had a lot of different hats at Salesloft. And um, customer success, I think, was a, a great introduction to me. And and like I mentioned, I just wanted any job that they were going to offer me. If they had said, you can come on board as an SDR, I would have said, okay, when do I start? Um, if they said, you can come on board and be a developer, I would have said, where do I take classes to figure out how to do this? I was just in love with the culture and the, the people that I had met. And I saw the vision and I, I thought it was a company worth joining. Um, so with that said, after doing customer success for... I guess it was probably about nine months before I started to realize like I probably would be better suited in a sales environment. Um, at the time, the customer success department was responsible for a lot. And one of those things was upgrades, but we weren't necessarily getting paid on upgrades. And I had more upgrades than any other person on the CSM team. And I had more cross sells at the time we were selling prospector and, and we were responsible for kind of introducing people to what is now just sales off. But at the time it was cadence. So I was, I was having more success in those conversations and I was more interested in those conversations. So I, I kind of figured it made sense for me to be more focused on that and getting a bigger paycheck, right? That's important. So um, our team was willing to work with me on it. They let me transition into an inbound SDR position to kind of try my hand there first. Um, because outbound is obviously pretty difficult and we were not selling a product like, like a LinkedIn or a Facebook where you call and everybody knows who you are. So, um, started under inbound, did that for six months, loved it and had the opportunity to really kind of fine tune my craft before I went to the outbound, then, uh, became a top performer on the outbound SDR team, managed that team for a year and a half and now have been a full cycle seller. How did you was it your idea to move into sales or was it their idea? It was mine. Um, so I actually, I talked with a couple different people about it. I talked with my manager at the time who was Katie Christian. Um, I talked with Derek Grant, who's our SVP of sales at sales off now, um, took him to barbecue and basically said like, what do you think? And he was like, nah, you'd suck. It, you'd, it, it would be terrible. You shouldn't do it. And it's, it's funny now to kind of look back hey, on that told, conversation. Told you would suck at it. <laughs> I think he was trying to challenge me. Um, he didn't think I was a hard worker. Reverse psychology move. Yeah, he didn't think I was a hard worker. And I remember very vividly when I was like entering into probably like my third month as the, the top of the leaderboard for the outbound SCR team. He came over to my desk and he was like, I didn't think you'd be willing to make a cold call. I'm, I'm glad that you've proved me wrong. Um, did you, when he did that to you, did you know that he was trying to reverse psychology you or did you fight? for it more like what was that like because I think and the reason I'm asking is I think this happens to people and sometimes they take that as like oh I guess I can't do it here right and you know that's the part I want to understand like what was your mentality when he said that yeah so I, I think you have to know Derek to, to know exactly the way that he would have said it because he wasn't saying it mm -hmm. in a way where it was meant to make me feel like okay, I should just stick with what I'm doing. Customer success is what I'm good at. This is fine. He was, he was pushing me to see how I would respond um, without being an asshole about it, which I think but, is an important piece. Right. But, and, but I also think ahead. too is that we do know Derek and I bet Derek could say that to someone else in the exact yeah. same way, in the exact same tone, and that might affect them differently than it affected Blanche. That's right? fair. So That's definitely fair. For you, because Derek's a really cool guy and he's a fair he's a fair man um what advice do you give to people when someone does that to them in their careers like hey wait a minute they're you know don't take this to heart right because i think some people do and and that's in a fair point of view that's derek's job is to yeah. make sure he hires the right people right um what advice would you give to someone when they hear their manager giving them like uh, are you sure are you really sure you want to do this you know yeah, what advice so would you give to people? It's interesting because I eventually became somebody who was doing that to my team. Um, you know, when I had an SDR reporting to me and they'd say, you know, I really think I should go into marketing or I think I should go into implementations or I want to be a manager. You kind of have to challenge them on that and figure out what is the, 
the real why behind it. And so I, I think as long as you can trust the person who's saying that to you, it's not the first conversation you've ever had with somebody. It's not somebody that's talking to you off the street or that you met at a bar or whatever. As long as there's a level of trust there, then know that they're doing that in your best interest. Um, and if they, if they, you're getting that question and it is making you doubt yourself, then that's the whole point of that question being asked, right? Because you clearly don't have enough confidence in yourself to take that new route or to take on that new challenge. You need to kind of take a, a second and, and reevaluate if there, if this one person saying one comment is going to be enough to make you kind of be rattled about what you are thinking about doing, even though you've thought about it for a while, then you haven't thought about it that clearly. So, so what's your advice to that person? Hey, it's okay to be rattled, right? That's yeah. part of the game. But now you need to think about, so how do you reassess Blanche? How do you say, okay, if this is what he's saying and I still want to do this, what do I do next to prove to Derek I'm ready? Right? What do I, you know, aside from hitting the number and, you know, some yeah. of that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I think it's a good question. So I guess the advice I would give to somebody to to continue to kind of prove that that is the path that you should be going down or that you do want to take, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding your question correctly, Richard. Um, yeah, you're understanding. Yeah, perfectly. What did you do? What did you do? So Derek says that to you. You assess yourself. You kind of look at it. Um, I know you said you're not a fighter in terms of verbal but I know you're competitive and don't like to yeah. lose, right? <laughs> Two different things. Uh, yeah. So how did you, how did you coach yourself to figure out what you needed to do? Make a plan. Um, figure out so what was exactly your plan? what you need What'd to you do. do. Yeah. So I, I started kind of interviewing people that were internally at the company, whether they were at, in a sales role or whether they were in a sales development role. What are the biggest challenges that you have? What are knowing me and what you know about me so far? What do you see my challenges being in these roles as well? Mm. Um, I asked people who were not necessarily in sales, but had previously been in sales, whether that was sales leadership or a sales role themselves, kind of getting their pulse on, again, what are the biggest challenges that you typically see? Have you seen somebody make this transition successfully? Have you seen somebody make this transition and fail? Um, and one thing, I went to a, uh, an event, it was a breakfast, I can't remember even the, the whole circumstance of the breakfast, but it was probably four years ago, it was around the time that I was looking to make that change. Um, and Tammy McQueen, who I know you guys both know, she was one of the people speaking on the panel. And she shared a Google Doc where it said all of the future roles that she wants and the skills that she has now and the skills that she needs to be able to get there. And I wasn't going to be able to get all the skills, but I'd known that I'd done some of them previously. And there are other things than just the ability to make a cold call or a level of confidence or whatever that can make you a good seller. So I kind of used her format as well as understanding from other people outside of SalesLoft, inside of SalesLoft, what are the biggest challenges that I should be aware of? How can I kind of make a plan for myself to get ahead of these? Um, does that help answer your question there, Richard? Uh, that, that's, I think that's the best articulated answer we've ever had for that kind of a question. Oh, um, <laughs> and I love the fact that, you know, I mean, like I'm sitting here going, oh my God, you should proselytize that. Like, how do you proselytize it and then philosophize it and then go out and proclaim it, right? And say, hey, particularly right now, for, you know, for those who are listening, you know, we're, we're recording this literally in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic. And it's kind of like, we know what's happening in the employment world. And it's kind of like, okay, if I'm going to have to go out and hunt for a new job, this is a great example of actually how do I do this? How do I show that I'm the right person to do this? So, yeah. um, so I, I think that was a beautiful answer. So thank you so much. So <clears throat> my son just walked in. Lance, so. you, <laughs> Hi, Bodie. Lance, you, uh, you started working remotely a while ago, right? Yeah, July. In July, so eight months ish. I don't know. Yeah, just about maybe nine. Yeah. So you had time to adjust in a way and and be prepared for this um, kind of moment. What was the what was the transition like? There's so many people going through it for the first time, and I think a, a lot of people that I've talked to are thinking that um, they're they're like really frustrated trying to figure things out. And I was this way too. It took me like 
almost two months before I really settled in. Um, yeah. Well, share share your experience in in the transition. It was under much calmer times, but share your experience <laughs> uh, moving you know remote because you left Atlanta and went back home to Greenville. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a couple things that that make it different from the circumstances now. Obviously, we were not under the exact circumstance where there was a pandemic or anything like that. Um, it was something where I was making a conscious choice to do it, and I had the time to mentally prepare for that. Um, the second piece of that is we were moving in with my parents temporarily. So I was not working in my own environment where I was able to control oh. my space. Yeah. My, as I mentioned, my dad is getting his MBA and he's super interested in technology and business and everything. And so there were times where I would come downstairs for, uh, for lunch and I would potentially go back upstairs because I didn't want to have an hour long conversation with my mom or my dad about anything that was going on because I just needed to focus and stay in the zone. Um, so it was, a, it was a different circumstance. Once we moved into the house that we're in now, um, I now have a whole room set up. It's the environment that I want. I actually even have, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but with, I just turned it on. I have like a, a um, SADS lamp, which is the seasonal effectiveness disorder. Um, oh season, <laughs> and I don't have that necessarily, but it has rained a ton here. And so being able to make sure that I have other things that are going to pick me up, um, from a, a like pr productivity perspective though, there have been a lot of things that have helped me. Um, we've created Slack channels specifically for our remote sellers. We, I actually started a happy hour for our remote sales team to get together every second Thursday of the month and just kind of talk and vent and, and see. When did you start that though? Oh gosh, a couple months ago, it was probably November, December. So it wasn't something that we did initially. So before it, all this. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's cool to see that a ton of other teams are doing that now, you know, regardless and it, um, I think it's something that will probably continue um, for a lot of companies yeah. that do have maybe part of their workforce, workforce remote or in the office. Um, so, I think, go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to finish. I have a question, but go ahead and finish your thought. I was going to say the, the biggest challenge for me though has been mentally because I am an extreme extrovert and I was in an office where I was working next to so many of not just my colleagues, but my best friends. And so leaving the office was more than leaving the office for me. It was leaving a group of people that I adore, that I admire, that I want to spend time with. I looked forward to getting up and going to the office every day. I didn't want to come home from work early because, you know, if people are still at the office, I want to hang out. Um, I love that environment. And so it's, it's been more of a mental game for me to figure out how to best stay engaged, even if it's just a day where it's just me. So I'm very thankful to have a dog. <laughs> so I'm not fully alone and she's employee of the month every month, but uh, I try to take a couple mile walks every day if I can. I go on a run or I've joined a gym. I, I'm also in a situation where I don't necessarily know a ton of people here outside of my immediate family. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out what are other ways that I can get engaged and make sure that I'm still building connections and not holding on super, super tightly to the people that are in Atlanta. Um, but if you look at my call log on my phone, half the calls are people that I work with. And they're not just calls about like, hey, let's talk about this deal. It's, how are you? I think it's helpful for right. people to That's understand that somebody who's um, nine months or so into this transition is still trying to figure out yeah. like the perfect method or the perfect strategy or whatever you right like I had a completely unreasonable expectation when I switched to working from home that I'd get into a rhythm like straight away and you know took me two months to get any kind of rhythm and now whatever rhythm I was in is thrown off by this but it's, but it's, it's all right like it's a living breathing thing to <clears throat> find the the rhythm find the space and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff not to put too much undue pressure on yourself to have it all figured out straight away you know and i think you're right there like yep. there's a level of giving yourself permission to do those things like i felt for a while like i shouldn't be going to the grocery store in the middle of the day and picking up you know 
three things that I might need for dinner later that night, or I shouldn't be walking to Starbucks in my afternoon. But those were things that I would do when I was in the office in Atlanta too, maybe not grocery shopping, but um, that was just because I wasn't necessarily in a place to do, have groceries at my desk all day. That didn't make sense to do that. But, you know, if I needed to go let my dog out, or if one of my friends wanted to go on a, on a 15 minute walk to just kind of de-stress, then those were things that we did. So it's a level of giving yourself permission to know that not every day has to be the exact same. You don't have to have a specific routine. And I know a lot of people are, are very, very adamant about having a routine. For me, it's, it's not ideal. What I've, I've, I've noticed a pattern for you. Um, you talked earlier about, um, you know, sort of preparing yourself, you know, Derek challenging you to do stuff. So you sort of went and mentally prepared for this next role. And then you said you had time to mentally prepare to go to work from home, right? Because you were moving yeah. to Atlanta and this is back in July of last year, 2019. What are a couple of things that, that you did to prepare to work from home? And granted, you're still doing that. But what were some of the early things that you did? Because I think that's a lot of people are still in that early stage. And I know we're already talking about it, but yeah. anything in particular like, oh, I did this and this and this. So it's funny, and you're going to see a trend again. I interviewed a lot of people. Um, I, I put something out on LinkedIn. Hey, guys, I'm going to be transitioning fully to work from home. Um, I want to talk to people who have done this and have not done this at a net new company. People who have transitioned from working at the company that they're in, in, in that environment, to now working from home for that same company. Because it's a whole different ballgame if you're working for a brand new company and you're remote for the first time. Those are two totally different mm -hmm. experiences. So. I wanted to talk to people who've had a similar experience and understand what were the biggest, again, challenges, what were the biggest hurdles for you? How long did it take you to get adjusted? What are the things that you've done to help yourself throughout this time? There were a lot of books recommended, a lot of podcasts, um, a lot of things that you can read, but what it really came down to, I, I realized you can do as much mental preparation as possible, but it's just a matter of doing it, particularly for working from home, or at least for me, because it is, it's different to say I work from home one day a week to doing it full time um, and not having the ability to, to connect with people right away. I was so used to, you know, if I had a, a contract that was stuck in legal, I would run to our general counsel's office and say like, hey, have you gotten this yet? Or if I needed um, to get one of our executive level leaders involved in a deal instead of sending in an email or writing on Slack or making a phone call or putting time on their calendar, I would just run into them in the hallway. And so those are the things that you can't necessarily prepare for because those are not the parts of your day that you're thinking about. You're thinking about how should I best set up my desk in my office and how do I make sure that I are, am getting all the information I need to my manager, to our management team, to my peers, how do I stay connected? Those were the things that I couldn't necessarily plan for. The, the one, the, the one, the one constant is is your ability to remain proactive in, in yeah. getting the help that you need. And <clears throat> I can't, I can tell you from somebody who's been in the leadership role, like that is so helpful. It's so helpful when my team members would, I joke around and say they pester me. Like I would tell them all the time, like come pester me come bug me, come distract me from whatever I'm doing. Like if you need something, if you have something urgent or you have some sort of blocker, like come get it. If you want to talk to me and you want my time, come get it. Don't wait for me. And you know, multiple times during the course of this conversation, you're showing how proactive you are to get the things that you need in order to propel you, you forward, whether that's in the office or at home interviewing all these you know people gathering advice making a plan uh, so i really hope people pay attention to that part and how you're not sitting back waiting for things to happen you're taking control being proactive and making things happen is a huge difference yeah i think that's an area where people can fail really easily if you just expect people to come to you regardless of what type of role you're in um i i mean I, it's you'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission always, in my opinion, and make sure that you are being the person that's pestering rather than saying, oh, he'll, he'll, he'll reach out to me. It may have been two weeks, but he'll reach out to me, I'm sure. Uh, I'll give it a few more days and then maybe I'll ping my manager about this. Just go for it. How do you, so it's interesting because I, you know, this, this is 
clearly an indication of why you're now officially number nine at the company, right? Tenure wise. <laughs> I, I hope Kyle, if you're listening, um, by all means, I hope, you know, you're taking care of her like a number nine employee. Um, <laughs> that that's for you, Blanche. Um, <laughs> but, but I, I also know that sales loft is huge on culture, right? And I can only assume that you having been there this long has affected that culture. What are you seeing sales loft do company wise to support this move from home, right? Like, because I know, look, I know Kyle, you and I've had conversations about how you have, and I still use this phrase, your level three discussions, right? Yeah. Like, how do you get to those, you know, there's level one, level two, and level three, and level three is really deep. How are you guys doing that in this transition right now with everybody starting to work from home and still keeping that, that amazing sales law culture? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. And uh, back in December, it was my five-year, we call it loft anniversary. It was my five-year anniversary with sales loft. Um, and I had the opportunity to talk to Kyle about some things that I feel about sales loft. Some, some things that maybe we should potentially change, what should we be looking at? And one thing that came up was I shared with him that I felt like our remote culture was struggling. Um, and I might feel that more than others just because I've been at the company so long and I've been so ingrained in the culture. So I realize that it's a little biased for me to say that. But it's really interesting because some of that feedback was initially taken and now it is full force ahead. So we continue to still have our team wide company all hands every two weeks. And they're encouraging everybody to have their, their video on. We actually, I'm sure Zoom is a loving life right now. We, um, we are one of the companies that had to upgrade because we couldn't have more than 300 participants on a Zoom meeting at one time. And we needed to have about 500 for our team wide all hands meeting two weeks ago. So we upgraded halfway through the, the all hands meeting, then everybody was able to get in. We were great. So we're still engaging in that way. There have been a lot more, um, things kind of pushed across the board. So for example, I know you guys talked to Sydney Sloan. She and her team did a, um, a scavenger hunt <laughs> for each person to do at their own homes and kind of bring to the table and say, okay, this is what I found or, or whatever there might be. And so um, we're getting creative from a leadership team to make sure that things are translated properly. There are, there are more meetings, but they are more effective in my opinion. Nobody's wasting anybody's time. We're very aware that everybody has a job to do, but we also want to stay engaged. So I know like our customer success team is doing a daily stand up together on the sales team. We're not doing that, but we're doing happy hours. We're doing uh, trainings. We're kind of taking this opportunity uh, yesterday on, on the team that I'm a part of. It's called Danny and the Jets. It's Danny Garcia's team. Um, we had a team where we had a team meeting, excuse me, where we went through kind of a path to partnership plan. How do you present this properly? What are some areas of weakness that we can all focus on? And we've now put together a Google Doc of about 25 things that we want to do team meetings on, and each of us is going to take turns leading those. So from a leadership standpoint, each of the different department heads, each of the different C-suite leaders is pushing those things through the organization and asking for feedback regularly about what else can we be doing? Where are we still struggling? But it seems like for the most part, things are going well from a, from a remote perspective, at least from somebody who's already been remote. <laughs> yeah. Have you noticed, yeah. any, have you noticed I, any big changes yet with your, any, with your pipeline and, and deals? Are you comfortable talking about, about that? Are you, are you noticing? Yeah, um, I, I'm not going to share numbers, but I will say last week was a very tough week for me. I, I lost about a deal a day because of coronavirus, and I was expecting to have the biggest quarter I've ever had. I was expecting to come out on top at the end of Q1, and now that's, that's pretty... So what, so, what is, so what is your plan, right? You're, you're a planner. You're proactive. You don't sit around and wait. <laughs> things. You've had... You've, You've had, maybe it's too fresh still, but like you got shell shocked last week and maybe a little bit of this week, right? Yeah. How, are, how are you trying to reset your, reset yourself, right? Yeah. And come up with a plan and, and figure out a way to continue to, you know, do as good as what is possible for you for the foreseeable future. So I think with this one, it's, 
it's harder to have a specific plan because we don't know exactly when this is going to end. We also don't know exactly how this is going to affect each individual type of company's businesses. And um, I was in a situation where I was working with a couple different companies that were all selling to SMB type businesses where they are restaurants, they are retailers, they are theaters, et cetera. And so naturally my pipeline got hit really hard because their businesses were hit really hard. So for me, I am trying to shift my mindset more than anything to this is not a quarterly game. This is an annual play. And we will come back in Q3, maybe, maybe Q4, hopefully sooner than that. But I've always had a hard time. Like the first time that I missed my monthly goal, even though we aren't measured by months, that was like a, a big strike on my confidence. I'm not somebody who likes to miss any goals. I like to always overachieve. And so um, I think this is more of a mental toughness game for me and having a plan for that. So I am controlling what I can control. I'm still trying to have as many conversations as possible. I still do have some opportunities that have survived and, and some companies that are actually thriving in this. So I know that it's not all lost. It's just a matter of shifting my mindset and planning for what can I be prepared for in Q3? What can I be prepared for in Q4? And how can I best stay in touch with these different companies without being without being a nuisance and without yeah. coming across as insensitive? Yeah. So every conversation I'm having, we're not necessarily saying like, hey, do you know anybody who's sick? But how are you transitioning to working from home? How are things going for you? Is there anything that we can do to help? Um, as a business, we're offering more webinars. I'm actually going to be recording a webinar next week about how to best use Salesloft as a full cycle AE. So there are, there are other things that I can focus my attention on in the meantime, um, but just putting our customers first and making sure that I'm, I'm giving off a positive vibe. I kind of hate the word vibe, but whatever. It's, it, it's what works here. We're from California. We're, <laughs> we're all about vibe. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think being as positive as I can and, and staying positive myself because getting, you know, hits, hits, hits in a row is really hard for me mentally. So I, I literally like wrote down a list of 10 things to be thankful for yesterday, which is super cheesy, but that's kind of my plan. It's very smart right now <laughs> doing that to maintain some perspective, you know. Um, I was, I was, I know we're getting sort of to the five minute warning point. Um, cause I know you've got some stuff to do. There's, I want to give one piece of advice that I read. Well, two pieces of advice that I read. One was an interview with Mark Cuban this week where he said really successful businesses right now are going back and reexamining the process mm -hmm. right? and where can we make this process better? And I think that's what I'm hearing you say, right? Whether it's you at your level for the process or whether it's the company, it's like, Hey, there's still something we can do better and we can yeah. come out of this with that piece. I thought that was great. The other one was, um, there's a, there's a great trainer out there, Michael Padone. And he, I read his blog yesterday and, and in the right timing, he was suggesting to people to say, hey, you know, Blanche, look, I know things are tough right now. Everybody's struggling. When we talk to people, there's kind of two groups. There's the group that's sort of having to batten down the hatches, which we totally respect and understand. And then there are other groups who are ready to start thinking about moving forward. Just so I don't bug you, Blanche, which bucket are you in? How can I support you no matter I which like bucket you're in? And I thought that was like, it was genius. Like, I really, I really respect Michael. Um, and I thought it was a great way to sort of, here's reality, tell us what you are, and then how can I help you no matter what the answer is? Like, I'm not going to bug you if you can't, but if you are trying to move forward, tell me that too, and we'll see what we can do. So, so that two pieces of just advice for you, but also for, for anybody listening. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the last thing we, we always like to ask this question at the end is, how can we help Blanche? How can we support you? Um, you know, we're big sales law fans. We, we definitely refer people to you. Um, but how can we support Blanche in her efforts? I mean, you guys have been great for me. Obviously, we, we had the opportunity to connect at the surf and sales last year, which I was very thankful to be a part of. So um, I don't know if there's anything in particular right now other than I want you to stay healthy. <laughs> I want you to stay safe Thank you. and that will help me because then I can still call on you guys when I need you. <laughs> <laughs> so selfishly, yeah. if you'll just stay healthy and stay inside, that will be the biggest help for me. <laughs> I've got bubble wrap right here, but you know, right here. So, uh, but I would, I would tell you that, you know, 
and, and I think Scott would say the same. Even if I'm not healthy, I would still take a call. Not just for well, you. I appreciate it. I'm never healthy anyways. <laughs> right, exactly. Not me yet. Part, part of the, the beauty of that is that even if I'm not feeling good and I can help someone else, that does help me feel better. Yeah, Whether absolutely. I'm physically hurt or emotionally, like it's a way to give back to people. And I yeah. hope, I, 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 you know, the, one of the beautiful things out of this situation, I'm seeing the world be nicer to each other. Absolutely. And I'm hoping that sticks. You know, yeah. um, I don't know that it will, at least in America, but um, I'm still optimistic for it. So, uh, Blanche, this has been awesome. Um, as always, yeah. good to catch up with you. Thanks for letting us, you know, do this on a, in a live situation. And, um, you know, Kyle, if you're listening, and I know you are, um, be sure you give Blanche a raise. That's, yeah. <laughs> She's five years in. There you in, go. Dude. Now you've Come helped on. me. She's <laughs> five, <laughs> She's Thanks, five years in. So, Good to see you. Talk soon. Bye, Bye guys. Talk to you soon.